the magic table, the gold donkey, and the club in the sack. Long, long ago, there lived a tailor who had three sons and just one goat. Since the goat had to supply all four of them with milk, they made sure to take her out every day to graze somewhere and to keep her well fed. The sons took turns at this task. One day, the eldest son took the goat out to the churchyard, where the tastiest grass was growing. He let her graze and frolic to her heart's content. In the evening, when it was time to return home, he asked, Little goat, have you had enough to eat? The goat replied, I'm really stuffed. Enough, enough. <coughs> then let's go back home, the boy said. He took her by the rope, walked her back to her stall, and tied her up. Well, said the old tailor, has the goat eaten her fill? Oh, yes, the son replied. She's so full that she doesn't want another blade of grass. The boy's father wanted to find out for himself, and so he went to the goat's stall, stroked the head of his beloved animal, and asked, Little goat, are you really full? The goat replied, Enough to eat? Hardly a chance. A graveyard's just a place to dance. I didn't find a single leaf. Meh. Meh. Well, I never, the tailor shouted, and he ran up the stairs to confront his son. You miserable liar! You tell me that the goat has eaten her fill when, in fact, you've let her starve! And in his rage, he took a measuring stick from the wall and used it to chase his son out of the house. The next day, it was the second son's turn to take the goat out. He found a spot for her along the garden hedge, where every kind of good grass was growing. And the goat ate every blade down to the ground. In the evening, when he wanted to get back home, he asked, Little goat, are you full now? The goat replied, I'm really stuffed. Enough, enough. Nah, nah. Well then, let's go back home, said the boy, and he led her to the stall and tied her up. Did the goat get enough to eat? The old tailor asked. Oh, she's so full that she doesn't want another blade of grass, his son replied. The tailor wanted to see for himself that she was full, and she went over to the stall and asked, Little goat, are you really full? And the goat answered, Enough to eat? Hardly a chance. A graveyard's just a place to dance. I didn't find a single leaf. <coughs> the godless wretch! The tailor shouted, letting a good creature like that starve to death. He ran up the stairs, and waving the stick, he chased the boy out the door. Now it was the turn of the third son who was anxious to do things the right way. He found some bushes with tender leaves and let the goat nibble on them. In the evening, when he wanted to go back home, he asked, Little goat, are you full now? The goat replied, I'm really stuffed. Enough's enough. <coughs> well then, come back home, the boy said, and he led her to the stall and tied her up. Well now, the old tailor asked, did the goat get enough to eat? Oh, yes, she's so full she doesn't want another blade of grass, the son replied. The tailor didn't trust him, and he went down the stairs and asked, Little goat, are you full now? The malicious animal replied, Enough to eat? Hardly a chance. A graveyard's just a place to dance. I didn't find a single leaf. <coughs> oh, you pack of liars, the tailor shouted. One is more wicked and unreliable than the next. Well, you can't make a fool of me any longer. Beside himself with rage, he raced up the stairs and gave the boy such a tanning with his stick that he fled the house. The old tailor was now alone with his goat. The next morning, he went down the hit stall, caressed the animal, and said, Come along, my dear little pet. I'll take you out to graze. He picked up her rope, and brought her to some green hedges, and some clumps of yarrow, along with everything else that goats like to eat. Now you can finally feast to your heart's content, he said to her, and he let her graze until sunset. Then he asked, Well, little goat, are you full? She replied, I'm really stuffed. Enough's enough. <coughs> then let's go back home, said the tailor, and he took her back to her stall and tied her up. 
As he was about to go, he turned around and said, Well, now you have finally eaten your fill. But the goat treated him no better and replied, Enough to eat, hardly a chance. A graveyard's just a place to dance. I didn't find a single leaf. Meh, When the tailor heard those words, he was stunned, for he now realized that he had driven his sons away for no reason at all. Just wait, he shouted. Throwing you out is too mild a punishment, you ungrateful wretch. I'm going to brand you so that you don't dare show your face among honest tailors any more. He ran up the stairs as fast as he could. He took out his razor and lathered the goat's head, and shaved it until it was smooth as the palm of his hand. And since the stick seemed too good for her, he picked up his whip and gave her such a thrashing that she leaped and ran off for her dear life. The tailor was now all alone in his house, and he began to feel deeply lonely. He longed to have his sons back again, but no one knew where they had gone. The eldest son had apprenticed himself to a carpenter, and he had been eager to learn and worked hard. When he finished his apprenticeship and was about to start his travels, the tr carpenter master gave him a little table made of ordinary wood. There was nothing special about its appearance, but it had one special quality. If you put it down and said, Table, set yourself, then instantly a clean tablecloth was spread out on a good little table, and a plate with a knife and fork suddenly appeared. Every inch of the table was covered with platters of roast meat and stewed meat, and a big glass of red wine sparkled on the table, making your heart glow. The young journeyman thought, That will keep you going for the rest of your life and he went out into the world in high spirits, and never stopped to ask whether an inn was good or bad, or whether you could get food there or not. When he didn't feel like stopping at an inn, he would take the little table off his back, set it up in a meadow, in a forest, or in a field, or wherever he wanted, and say, Set yourself! And then everything he could ever want was right there. At last he decided to go home to his father. He was sure that his father was no longer angry, and that the old man would be glad to see him with the magic table. On the way home, he stopped one evening at an inn that was filled with a large party of travelers. They welcomed him and invited him to sit down with them and share their food, otherwise he might not get anything to eat. No, no, he said the carpenter, I don't want to make your last few morsels. Let me invite you to be my guests. They all started laughing and were sure that he must be joking around. But then he set his little wooden table up in the middle of the room and repeated the words, Table, set yourself. Instantly the table was covered with all kinds of food, far better than what the innkeeper could have provided, and the fragrant aroma quickly rose up to the noses of the travelers. Help yourselves, dear friends, the carpenter said, and when the travelers realized that he was saying, they didn't wait to be asked a second time, but pulled out their knives and fell to. They were astonished, by the way, new platters piled high with food would appear as soon as a dish was empty. The innkeeper watched all of this from a corner of the room, and he didn't know what to do, but he thought, I could use a cook like that in my kitchen. The journeyman and his companions had a good time until late at night. Finally, they decided to go to bed, and the young carpenter put his magic table against the wall and retired for the night. The innkeeper's thoughts gave him no peace that night, and he remembered that there was an old table in the storeroom that looked just like the magic table. He crept out of bed quietly and switched his table with the magic table. The next morning, the journeyman paid for his lodgings and loaded the table with his back, never dreaming that it might not be the right one. He set out on his way, and at noon he reached the house of his father, who welcomed him with joy. "'Well, my dear son, what trade have you learned?' he asked. "'Father, I've become a carpenter,' he replied. "'That's a good trade,' the old man replied. "'And what have you brought back from your travels?' "'Father, the best thing I've brought back is this little table.' The tailor examined the table from all sides and said, "'That's not really much of a masterpiece you've got there.' It looks to me like a shabby old piece of furniture. But it's a magic table, the son replied. When I stand it up and tell it to set itself, the finest dishes appear out of thin air, and wine, too, that makes your heart grow. 
let's invite all our friends and relatives. For once they'll get a chance to eat and drink their fill, for the little table will give them more than enough to eat. When the guests were all present, the table was set up by the sun in the middle of the room, and said, Table, set yourself. But nothing happened. The table stayed as empty as any ordinary table that doesn't take orders. The poor carpenter realized that someone had switched tables on him, and he was mortified by the fact that he had looked just like a liar. All the relatives laughed their heads off, and they had to go back home as hungry and thirsty as when they arrived. The father took out his tools and went back to being a tailor, and the son found a job with a master carpenter. The second son found a miller to whom he apprenticed himself. When his time was up, the master said to him, Because you worked so hard, I'm going to give you a very special kind of donkey. But he will not draw a cart for you, and he also refuses to carry sacks. Then what is he good for? asked the young journeyman. He spits gold, the miller replied. If you put on a cloth under him and say, Bricklebrit, he was a good animal, will spit gold pieces from the front and behind. That sounds like a good thing, said the journeyman, and he thanked the miller and went out into the world. Whenever he needed money, all he did to do was say Bricklebrit, and to the animal and it started raining gold pieces. He had just to pick up up. Wherever he went, the best was not too good for him, and the more expensive the better, for his purse was always full. After traveling around for a while in the world, the second son thought, I really should go see my father. Once he sees this gold donkey, his anger will vanish, and he will welcome me with open arms. It so happened that he ended up in the same inn where his brother's table had been switched. He was leading his donkey by the bridle when the innkeeper offered to take the animal and tie it up. But the young journeyman said, Don't go out of your way. I'd like to take my gray mare to the stable and tie him up myself. I want to know exactly where he is. That struck the innkeeper as odd, and he was sure that anyone who had to look after his donkey couldn't have much money to spend. But when the stranger reached in his pocket and took out two pieces of gold, telling him to get something good, the innkeeper's jaw dropped, and he ran off to get the very best fare that money could buy. After dinner, the traveler asked how much he owed, and the innkeeper, who was easier to talk it up twice what it really cost, asked him for a few more pieces of gold. The second son reached into his pocket, but he had run out of gold pieces. If you just wait a moment, my dear innkeeper, I'll get some more gold pieces. And he left the room, taking the tablecloth with him. The innkeeper couldn't figure out what was going on, and he was so curious that he sneaked after him. When he saw that the travel had bolted the door to the stall, he looked through in a keyhole. The stranger spread the tablecloth under the donkey, shouted, Bricklebrit! And instantly the donkey began to spit pieces of gold from the front and back until it was raining pieces of gold. Egads, the innkeeper said. What a nice way to mint ducats! I wouldn't mind at all having a money bag like that. The traveler paid up and retired for the evening. Late at night, the innkeeper tiptoed into the stall, removed the master of the treasury, and left the another donkey in its place. Early the next morning, the son left with the animal, thinking he had his gold donkey with him. He arrived at his father's house that afternoon, and the old man was glad to see him again, welcoming him with open arms. "'Well, my son, what trade have you learned?' the old man asked. I've become a miller, the son replied, and what have you brought back home from your travels? Nothing but a donkey. There are enough donkeys around here, the father said. I wish you had brought back a goat instead. That may be true, the son said, but this is an ordinary donkey. I've brought home a gold donkey, and when I say Bricklebrit, then the good beast spits out a whole bundle of gold coins. Let us invite our relatives over. I'll make them all rich. That sounds like a great idea to me, the tailor said. Now I won't have to torture myself any longer by being on pins and needles. And he raced off to invite the relatives over. When everyone had gathered in the house, the miller told them to make room. He spread out a cloth and brought the donkey into the room. Just watch this, he said. 
and shouted, Bricklebrit! But what fell down had nothing to do with gold pieces, and it was plain to see that this animal understood nothing about the art of minting, for not every ass can make money. The poor miller made a long face. He realized that he had been cheated and apologized to his relatives, who went home as poor as they had come. There was no way around it. The old man had to go back to his sewing, and the son hired himself out to a miller. The third brother apprenticed himself to a turner, and since that was a trade that requires real art, his training had lasted the longest. His brothers wrote and told him how badly they had fared, and how, on the night of their homecoming, an innkeeper had robbed them of their magical gifts. When the turner had finished his apprenticeship, and was about to start traveling, the master turner gave him a sack as a reward for all his hard work. There's a club in that sack. I'll throw the sack over my shoulder, and it's bound to come in handy sometime, the turner said. But what in the world can I do with that club? All it does is add weight to the sack. I'll tell you what you can do with it, the master turner replied. If anyone ever threatens harm to you, just say, Club, get out of that sack. And the club will jump right out and dance a little jig on their backs, so that they won't be able to move a bone in their bodies for a whole week. And the club won't get up until you say, Club, get back in the sack. The turner thanked him and slung the sack over his shoulder, and whenever anyone got a little too close or threatened him, he would just say, Club, get out of that sack! And the club would jump out and pound the dust out of the chap's coat or jacket while it was still on his back, without waiting for him to take it off. All that happened in a flash, so that the fellow next in line had his turn before he knew what hit him. One evening the young turner arrived at the inn where his two brothers had been swindled, he put his knapsack down on the table in front of him, and started to tell about all the fabulous things he had seen in this world. Yes, he said, you can find magic tables, gold donkeys, and the like. They're all just fine, and I'm not saying anything bad about them, but they're really nothing compared with the treasure that I have earned and that I've got right here in my sack. The innkeeper's ears perked up. What in the world could that be, he thought. The sack must be full of jewels. I really deserve to get those, too, for all the good things come in threes. At bedtime, the turner stretched out on the bed and used his sack as a pillow for his head. When the innkeeper was sure that his guest was fast asleep and that no one else was in the room, he went over and began to tug and pull very carefully at the sack, hoping to get it away and to put another in its place. But the turner had been waiting for him to do just that. The innkeeper was about to give a good hard tug, when the turner cried out, Club, get out of that sack! In a flash, the little club jumped out, went at the innkeeper, and gave him a sound thrashing. The innkeeper began screaming pitifully, but the louder he screamed, the harder the club beat time on his back, until at last he fell down on the ground. Then the turner said, now hand over the magic table and the gold donkey, or the dance will start all over again. Oh no, said the innkeeper. I'll be glad to give you everything, if only you'll make that little devil crawl back into his sack. The journeyman answered this time. I will, but watch out. There'll be more where that came from. Then he said, Club, get back in the sack, and left him in peace. The next morning the turner went back home to his father taking the magic table and the gold donkey with him. The tailor was overjoyed to see him, and asked him what he had learned in foreign lands. Dear father, he replied, I've become a turner. A trade that requires real art, the father said. What have you brought back from your travels? A precious object, dear father, a club in a sack. What? the father cried out. A club? Hardly worth the effort. You can make something like that out of any tree around. Not one like this, dear father. When I say, club, get out of that sack, the club jumps out and does a nasty little dance with anyone who's not nice to me. And it doesn't stop dancing until the fellow's on the ground, begging for mercy. You see, with this club, I manage to recover the magic table and the gold donkey which that scoundrel of an innkeeper took from my brother's. Now go find both of them, and invite all our kinfolk. 
I'm going to wine and dine them and fill their pockets with gold. The old tailor could hardly believe his ears, but he went and invited all the relatives around. The turner put a cloth down in the parlor and ushered in the gold donkey and said to his brother, Now, dear brother, go ahead and give him his orders. The miller said, Bricklebrit, and instantly gold pieces fell to the cloth as if they were raining money, and the donkey didn't stop until everyone had as much as they could carry. I can see that you wish you had been there too. Then the turner brought in the table and said, Dear brother, talk to your table. As soon as the turner said, Table, set yourself. The table was set and covered with the most appetizing dishes. Everyone at the home of the good tailor feasted as they had never before feasted, and they all stayed until late at night, enjoying themselves and living it up. The tailor took his needle and thread, his yardstick and flat iron, and locked them up in a cupboard. He lived happily and in luxury with his three sons. But whatever became of the goat that had made the tailor chase his three sons away? Well, I'll tell you. She was so ashamed of her bald head that she found a fox's home and crawled into it. When the fox came back home, a pair of big eyes flashed out at him in the darkness. He got scared and ran away. He met a bear, who saw that the fox had a frantic look on his face, and asked, What's the matter, brother fox? Why are you making a face like that? Oh, Redback replied, a ferocious beast is sitting in my shelter. He glared out at me with fiery eyes. I'll take care of that, the bear said, and he went over to the hole with the fox and peered in. But when he saw those fiery eyes, he too got scared and didn't want to have anything to do with the beast. Off he went. While fleeing, he met a bee who noticed that he looked upset and asked, Bear, you look really miserable. What happened on your high spirits? It's easy for you to talk, said the bear. There's a ferocious beast with fiery eyes in the old redback's house. We just can't get it out of there. The bee said, I feel sorry for you, old beat. I'm just a poor, pathetic creature whom you've never even bothered looking at, but I think I can help you. The bee flew into the fox's hole, landed on the goat's bald, shaved head, and struck her so hard that she jumped up and bleated, and ran out into the world like a madwoman, and to this day no one knows where she went.